Welcome to the Boone Podcast. I'm Brett Boone, and today on the program, I'm joined by the head baseball coach of the LSU Tigers. He's fresh off a world college world series championship and we're glad to welcome to the program uh ladies and gentlemen jay johnson jay thanks for coming on you got it brett awesome to be on with you uh congratulations that was awesome i was uh i was at a golf tournament in seattle and i tuned into you guys and i know it was kind of over after the about the fourth inning but really cool um brings me back to memories I, I remember being in high school and dreaming about the college world series and watching my my heroes and that dog pile at the end um has it hit you yet how many phone calls you got <laughs> yeah um it's a miracle we're on this thing i just i happened to pick up my phone when you texted me and i was like yeah sure i'll do that but there's about 500 text messages on one phone and about 700 on the other phone so I got a lot of uh, getting back to to people here in the next couple of weeks. So, um, wow, that's awesome. I mean, I, and take me through. Oh, okay, all right, set it up because I saw the games. First game against Florida, you go extra innings. Second game, you get it's a boat race. You get you get blown out. What are you telling those kids after game two? Your one game, you got the final game. It's it's winner take all. After game two, and you know, being a player, when you get blown out in a game like that the night before, the momentum is not on your side. Florida's right. feeling pretty good at that point. Yeah. And, and we're still, you know, we think we've all been in that position. Uh, I remember being a college player. You know, you're, you're, you don't have that honed experience that you have later in life. Uh, but what do you tell those kids after game two? Yeah, I think uh, one thing we've talked about all year is mastering uh, the art, if you will, of moving forward, no matter what had happened. You know, you sweep a team, you lose a series, um, you know, moving on in baseball is such a big deal. Uh, it's not always the team with the best players. It's the team that plays the best that day. And we really just condensed the score to one to one. <laughs> we won Saturday night. They won Sunday. It was one to one. And then I just tried to paint this picture. This team, our team, 53 wins in Omaha, one game to win the national championship. I think we all would have signed up for that, you know, six months ago and uh, felt very good about it. We knew the Sunday game was going to be hard because we had to come through the loser's bracket. And that was the one day where the pitching was going to get a little dicey. And then once the score got away from us a little bit, I, I started to play for Monday in terms of saving our, our bullets, you know, with the pitching staff and those types of things. And it kind of let the score get out of hand. So I kind of took responsibility for, for the lopsided loss. And I was like, this team, one game, national title, let's go. And, uh, and they responded in a big way. Yeah. And it's not like, it's not like you're playing a stranger, you know, you're playing no. somebody in the SEC, you're playing <laughs> yeah. Florida. So you guys been there, done that. They've seen, they've seen that. So maybe that was a little bit uh, because you knew each other so well, it wasn't as, Oh, who's this team out of nowhere that just came and whooped us, you know? Yeah. Um, you went through some tough teams, Kentucky, Oregon State, Tennessee, Wake Forest, and finally you got to Florida. Uh, I get back to the dog pile. That's that's kind of something they've been doing uh in Omaha forever. Is that the end? But when when the kids are out there, they're enjoying that. It's kind of hitting home. What are you and your coaches? Are you are you just kind of having words with each other? Or are you just saying nothing, or or what is it at that point? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm such a so like in the moment, like process oriented. It's, you know, stay with the task at hand. Like it didn't even really hit me like that it was going to happen until the first out of the ninth inning. Like we got a ground ball to short. Jordan Thompson picked it up, threw a strike over to first base. And then I kind of started to like get emotional. It's like, wow, we're winning the national championship. And like, I never remember feeling that way in the middle of a baseball game. And, uh, so it kind of was able to take that ninth inning in and obviously the strikeout, Gavin Guidry strikeout. I just kind of stood there and, and watched those guys, you know, pile on top of each other because we believed we could do it. And, you know, I've been to Omaha a couple other times. This was the first time from day one of the season, though, I believed we had a team that could win a national championship. Now I've had others emerge to where you believed you could do that, but this was this was supposed to happen. I mean, we've got a great team. We have the best pitcher in college baseball. We have the best hitter in college baseball. We have great role players. You know, a ton of guys will, will be major league players someday. And it's one thing for people to write about you, how great you are. It's another thing to go out and execute it over a 
71 game season. And uh, just the consistency of our team is something I'll always be proud of. So in that moment, it was just about kind of admiring the consistency of the work and enjoying those guys celebrating that. A lot of history at LSU. Uh, I remember, man, I got my heart broken at LSU in 1990. Skip Bertman was obviously the kind of the iconic skipper that uh, from LSU, but we went to a regional at, at your place at the time, the old stadium. And man, we had a good regional. We were blowing everybody out. We we're in that. We've got a LSU's got to beat us twice. And they did. They beat us twice uh, to for them to go on to the College World Series. And and we didn't go. But uh, I remember that city. It's just it was something different because at that stage of my uh, my career, you know, we were in the Pac-6. You were you were a Pac-12 uh, coach at U of A for five years. Diff it was different back there in the 90s. You know, the Pac-6 was kind of it. Yeah. Stanford and U of A and A-State and SC was was in the mix. Um, things has changed, and I, and I want to talk to you about that a little bit later. But that was the biggest stage to date that I had played on. I mean, you go to a USC game, you know, on Friday night against Stanford, we might get four or 500 people. Nobody cares. We're in LA. There's a lot of other things going on, but I remember going back to Baton Rouge and that city turned out for that regional. We were walking around. We were like rock stars, you know, and we were just USC baseball players, a lot of fun. College baseball's huge there. So, so because of the history, what does that mean for the LSU Tigers? You've had, you had big shoes to fill when you signed up uh, to be this, this friend or not franchise this team's uh head coach yeah it's awesome and um you know i thought i understood it you know coming out here it was part of the draw you know you have 13,000 14,000 for home games you know a tuesday night game will have 10,000 people still um it's it's a baseball school you know a great football program too but we are a baseball school and there's there's really no place like it and uh, they're intense and they're passionate you know i think in the big leagues the only thing that would compare to it is maybe the yankees and I think it kind of finally hit me when we came back to the hotel um, Monday night and the amount of people in the lobby, I mean, music's blaring and they'd been there the whole, all eight games of the college world series to send us off or welcome us back after a win. But in that moment, hearing everybody just say, thank you. And thank you coach. And the smiles on their faces and the, and the joy, like the LSU baseball is like the thing in Louisiana. And um, it kind of hit me like how big a deal this is. It's always been a big deal to me. I mean, we lost in the finals at Arizona one year. Um, you know, that was heartbreaking. And so, I mean, it was personally a really gratifying moment, a gratifying moment for our team. But to see how important it was for all the fans uh, was a really big deal. And it, it kind of finally sunk in like what I'm doing affects a lot of people in the state. And, and I'm really proud of how this team represented it. You've coached a lot on the West Coast, uh, San Diego, Nevada, U of A. Um, now in the SEC, what's the biggest difference you noticed since you went over to the SEC? I think just depth of resources uh, that people put into college baseball and then depth of talent on rosters. And, you know, uh, the two Super Regionals we won at Arizona, we beat Mississippi State and Ole Miss. So two SEC teams, you know, we played and beaten Arkansas a few times in the regular season. Um, so I, I was like, I'm really excited about this challenge of the competition, but now doing it one weekend in the super regional versus 10 in a row. And then the sec tournament, and then we actually were six and one against sec teams in the NCAA tournament. Like it's, it's a beast. The, the lineups are longer. I mean, the seven or eight hole hitter can hit a grand slam in the eighth inning to beat you. Uh, every guy out of the pen is 93 to 97, you know, with a, with an out pitch. Uh, the starters are legit. There's speed, power, solid hitting skills throughout every lineup. And then the fans and the resources and the road environments are are something to see. And it's it's not an indictment. I'm a West Coast guy my entire life. I stick up for baseball on the West Coast as much as anybody. Just the way things have evolved with the SEC network and resources when you're putting all of this uh, into these programs, I mean, the best players in the country now are going to come to the SEC. Right. And that was, if I had one concern about being able to sustain what we were doing at Arizona is kids were starting to fly over the top of us. 
And we had recruited California so well because that's what the best Arizona teams uh, had done. But it was getting harder and harder. And, um, you know, now here at LSU, we're going to compete with the teams in our league for players. But that's about it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it it changed because I worked for the A's in, in uh, 2014, 2015. I went got back in the game and I was a special assistant. And uh, I remember during the tournament, uh, they said, Brett, why don't you go get some, you know, some some scouting experience? I said, all right, this will be good. They sent me to the SEC. They said, that's where all the best players are. And we really were heavy there. Uh, and just thinking back to my college, it, was, it wasn't always that way. It was that the big boys were at Stanford. And like I mentioned, U of A, A State, that was where, yeah, you had the, the Mississippi States and the Floridas uh, and LSU at that time. But it wasn't solely the hotbed there. Um, college baseball in general has changed a lot. You know, I remember going to college. I got a full ride. They don't have full rides anymore. It's not like that. The dynamics change on the professional side. The economics have changed. If you're a first round pick, you're not going to college anymore. Back in the back in the day, you still might be able to get a first or a second round pick to come to college because the money wasn't overwhelming. You know, they weren't getting two, three, four million dollars to sign. They were getting 80 grand, 100, 180,000. So that Stanford scholarship was worth something that was kind of comparable. What do you see the biggest change in college baseball over the years from your college days to present? Yeah, I think you hit on it is, um, you know, we really we compete in recruiting with other schools, but we're really competing with Major League Baseball for those top guys. I mean, we just won the national championship, had the number one recruiting class show up to school and we lost like eight guys in the draft last year. I mean, it was our, our first recruiting class. So obviously we were going gangbusters and trying to get everybody. But I mean. We had, you know, Mikey Romero signed with the Red Sox in the first round. The Padres gave Robbie Snelling $3 million. And I'm such a believer in college baseball. And I look back at, you know, guys like you and, you know, Mark McGuire. And I mean, it's all over like guys that went to college, developed and went on to these long, successful major league careers. And then I look at what the environments that these guys get to play in it, like LSU or Texas or these places, like that prepares you to win. And if you're ever going to make it to the major league, Major League Baseball, you have to know how to win. And I don't know that the minor leagues necessarily do that. Now, they might develop baseball skill that leads you to winning. I just I look at that environment in Omaha and uh, I man, it would have to be a high price tag for somebody to really buy themselves out of that. And I don't ever make any decisions about money for people. I don't I stay out of that. But um, it's a really valuable experience. And I, I really wish like we we're almost like basketball or however they do it, where players would have to declare, like before the draft happens, I'm either signing or I'm going to school. It's not, it's not, hey, we'll see what happens. And um, yeah, I just really believe in college baseball and uh, really believe in what we do. And at LSU, like I want to win championships, but I want to win championships because we're developing the players to be the best that they can be. Like I talk about it in recruiting all the time. We're a training ground for major league baseball and um, very serious about developing players and, and I just think most guys should go to college. I mean, if sure, if you're getting seven million bucks as the fifth pick in the draft, I got it. I mean, I'm not gonna, right, not gonna right. kind of oversell that, but I just really believe in the college path to major league baseball. Jay, I've I've had so many guys on this program and we've talked about that and and uh so many players. <clears throat> When I was 18 years old, man, I thought I should be the first pick. And, you know, overall in the draft, I was in the 29th round. So I really didn't have that option of going pro. I had the USC or the 29th round money. It really wasn't an option for guys like me. But, man, was I hurt when they when they didn't take one of the 29th round. I'm like, how could you, you know, I wanted to be, that's all I wanted to be was a professional baseball player. I went the college route. Wow, am I. I look back, I was so fortunate to, I didn't have to make that decision because I'm with you. The college experience, um, there are so few players, I think, that are ready and I, physically and mentally. Now, there's some players that are ready physically to go professional, but to have that that combo of, of physically and mental I think that's so rare in today's game. Who knows what would happen to me if I signed at 18 years old and went off to Beloit? I mean, who knows? 
But the SE experience, it allowed me to grow up. It kind of with kit gloves, you know, I still was swinging an aluminum bat. I still was kind of, I was eased into the process. I was playing against definitely a lot better competition, but I wasn't playing 162 games a year. I was playing, we went from the high school program. Oh, now we've got to play 70 some odd games and summer ball. You know, back then I went, you went to Alaska or Cape Cod. Now there's a lot more options. Those, those programs are still there, but it just seemed for me, it, it, it helped me grow up and mature and kind of in a little bit of a bubble and still have that social life. I see kids that, that go to pro ball, they're 18. All of a sudden, mommy's not there to do your laundry. <laughs> you know, you're, you're on your own. This is a job. And if you don't do your job, well, you get fired. And, it, and it's, I think it's the maturation process is really quick. And I don't think everybody's capable of handling it. Yeah, of course there are a few people that can obviously, obviously people go to the big leagues, uh, nowadays when they're 19, 20 years old. So there are them out there, but I'm with you in, in the college experience. It's really tough to match. And, and that pro-life before you're ready is really a, a tough life. Yeah, I think anytime a player turns down money and decides they're going to use college as their path for development for Major League Baseball, like my antenna goes up, like I have to help this player and I'm going to be at my best so that they can you know, get a return on the investment of the time that they're putting in their career at college. And then the last year I've had 16 players between San Diego, uh, Nevada and Arizona make it to the major leagues. And that's really, really gratifying and as good an endorsement for why you should come to college or come play for our program as, as any that you could give and uh, take that very seriously. And then when you're developing players at that level, the winning just kind of takes care of its, itself. You know, you make a good point there, and I, I've, I've never thought about that. You must get a lot of enjoyment when you see a player that you had uh, make it to the big leagues, and he calls and he says, hey, coach, you know, because thinking back to when I made my debut, you know, I called my, I called my mom, I called my dad, I called my grandpa, but I called my college coach, and I called my high school coach to, in case they were wondering. I got called up to the big leagues and how – how thankful I was for their impact in my life and my development. That's got to be something maybe everybody doesn't think about when you get that phone call from that kid that, you know, you've got a lot of time into and, and you put a lot of your, your resources into him and, and emotionally you probably get connected to these kids. I mean, I know when I just did that minor league thing for a couple of years, I got invested in these kids and it was like, when I, when, as I saw him go from A ball to double A uh, to triple A, and they were right on the brink, it was cool for me to watch. Like maybe I just, if I had a tiny part, you don't need the recognition, but just knowing you were a tiny part of his development, getting him to where he was, that's got to be a pretty, pretty satisfying phone call. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, and it ranges all over the place. Had first rounders, you know, Chris Bryant, number two pick in the draft, four time all star MVP. Like that's th those ones are awesome. But, you know, he was probably going to be a major leaguer no matter where he went to college. And then, you know, Cesar Salazar this year, he made the opening day roster for the Astros after five and a half years in the minor leagues and um, was as an eighth or ninth round pick. You know, Jared Oliva, a guy, you know, that was up with the Pirates last year, um, you know, was cut from his high school team, you know, was kind of a developmental guy that was just at. Arizona when I got there and then was a great player for us and worked his way to the major leagues. And, you know, there's stories all, all through there. And uh, it's awesome to be a part of that and see them, you know, realize their dream of becoming a major league player. You're known as a relentless recruiter. And I guess you have to be in today's game. You got to, I talked to Chip Hale and I've talked to Willie Bloomquist, who was a longtime teammate of mine. They both gone to U of A and at a state now. Um, I asked him this question. I want to ask you the same NIL. Has it helped the college game or hurt it? I think it remains to be seen because, you know, I don't really know what's really true out there and what's not true. I think anytime somebody puts something on the internet, I think nowadays, you know, part of the people will dismiss it. Part of it will take it as fact. And the bottom line is like, it's a, it's an NCAA violation to offer it as a recruiting inducement. And so I think the separator is what schools have resources for potential for NIL that players can capitalize on when they're at the school, you know? And so 
I, I think it remains to be seen. Like, I mean, I read some stuff pretty funny about like our team and, you know, we bought a roster and this and that. And it's like, that's the furthest thing from the truth. Like Tommy White, our third baseman transferred from North Carolina state because he wanted to be a third baseman and not a designated hitter. And our third baseman last year, Jacob Berry transferred from Arizona, you know, with me to LSU became a third baseman and then signed for $6.3 million. That was a pretty good path of what Tommy White wanted to do. So that's the reason that he came. You know, Thatcher Hurd transferred from UCLA to LSU. He wanted to play in the SEC, wanted to play against the best competition. Well, he's starting the national championship game against Florida. Had eight wins, three or four saves, really developed throughout the year, got a chance to be a first rounder. So I think at the heart of it, like, the players I want, I want them to want us for the right reasons, which is development, winning, becoming the best that they can be. Is there NIL opportunities at LSU? Of course there is, but that's not the reason that they're coming here. So the answer, honestly, as crazy as it sounds, is I don't really know. And you never know what's true. Sometimes I wonder if you know kids will tell us, hey, I'm getting this deal with some school. Or are they just trying to sound cool? Or is that like, yeah, that could be a big part of it. Is this actually happening? And and the answer is, I don't really know. Um, College game. It's taken a turn and there's a lot of pro, uh, ex pro, ex big league guys going to the college side. Something that that really didn't happen back in in my day. And I mentioned them earlier Bloomquist, Eric Wedge, Jose, Jose Cruz Jr. Now is a is a head coach Chip Hale uh, at U of A. Now your old alma mater, or not alma mater, but your old school that you you were there five or six years. Um, what's that say about the college game? You're it's attracting everybody. Yeah, Ex- I, big league managers are now head coaches at, at at big programs. Yeah, I think it's awesome. I think um, I think they, they should be blended together as one. Like I said, I wish we could change the draft thing where. The high school player, hey, man, you have to declare and you're in or you're going to school. I think that would clean up a lot of the synergy between college and pro baseball. But, I mean, you look at that College World Series. I mean, that environment was electric. I mean, we never had a game that we played with less than 25,000 fans in the stadium at the College World Series. And uh, the quality of players, I mean, it was unbelievable. Like, you know, in our bracket in Omaha, you know, playing Tennessee, uh, Andrew Lindsay, their first pitcher is going to be a major leaguer. Uh, Josh Hartle for Wake Forest, left-hander, going to be a major leaguer. Uh, Drew Beam coming back and playing Tennessee, going to be a major leaguer. Rhett Lauder is unbelievable for Wake Forest, going to be a major leaguer. Um, Hurston Waldrip and Brandon Sprout for Florida. So in our eight games, uh, we probably saw seven surefire major league pitchers. And I mean, if that doesn't speak to the health of the college game, I don't know what does. I mean, Paul Skeens for us, I mean, about to get 10 million bucks in a few weeks here in a draft and he deserves every bit of it. Dylan Cruz, our center fielder, is going to get about 10 million bucks and deserves every bit of it. So I think when you look at the way that's growing, it's attractive for the, you know, Willie Bloomquist, who's a great baseball guy, Chip Hale, who became a friend of mine during my time at U of A. And I'm really happy that he's there and, and the coach there. Um, you know, those guys are, are seeing that, hey, maybe it's a little better lifestyle for them and their families, but it's pretty high level baseball and they get a chance to still be part of the path for the for the player to help them get to the major leagues. And Willie talked about it. And and to this day, Willie's one of my all time favorite, favorite teammates. And he talked about, you know, we we're always talking about the baseball and developing them and and getting them to the big leagues. And there's that side of it. But there's the other side where most guys don't have big league careers, even if they're great college players and that, but you get to, you get to be a part of the development of, of developing into young men that are, that are good people and go out and are successful in life. Everybody's not going to go to the big leagues and play 10, 15 years. And that's the side of it, the glory side of it. Like, Oh, see that he, he played the big leagues for 10, 15 years, but you get to be a part of, of molding these kids uh, kind of, kind of the father away from home. You know, I, I thought about that. My son went to Princeton 
And that's all the way across the country from San Diego where I'm at. And when we were choosing the school, obviously I was leaving it up to him. He was a student, obviously, to go to be considering Princeton. But I looked at the coach and I said, I didn't look at him as a coach of, oh, are you going to teach my son how to play baseball at a better level? I thought, what kind of man is he? And when when I'm not able to be there all the time, do I want him around this person to to help him to mold him into the young man? And the answer was yes. And that's some of the most important things going away to college. Not necessarily, yeah, the X's and O's, uh, you want to develop them baseball wise. But developing these guys as young men, I think, is the ultimate most important thing. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. And, um, you know, I take that very seriously from my chair. I mean, in a place like LSU, I mean, my job is to win games and, you know, get to Omaha. And I understand all of that. But, there's definitely a bigger picture and uh, I've actually enjoyed the, the intensity of this platform and then tried to blend that with what you're saying, because I mean, we have some incredibly high highs and some really lows and to teach them how to, to, to deal, you know, with those, you know, like a man. And I've always looked at this as, you know, they come in as boys and this is their transition to manhood. And it's like, a, a, I explain this all the time, a boy is somebody that does whatever they want whenever they want and then they cry when they don't get their way and then a man does what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it how they're supposed to do it whether they like it or not and then you know you live with the result and then you uh adjust or react to the result in a mature fashion and um that's some of the most gratifying parts of this thing and and we have stories all all over i mean jordan thompson our shortstop had a awful college world series until the final game and was able to pick himself back up, get a couple hits. I mean, played great defense in the last game and, um, you know, overcoming the adversity of making two errors the night before and being one for 30 going into the championship game. Uh, that's one of the most gratifying moments of my career, honestly. Very cool. For those, for those people right now listening to the Boone podcast, what advice, and I want to talk to the parents out there, what advice do you have to the parents of the young ball player developing, getting ready, you know, it could be a high school could be, you know how it is in, in travel ball these days and the parents and their involvement, but what's the best advice you give these, these parents to, to really keep it in perspective? Yeah, I think there's two things. I think and this is society, you know, and as competitors, we all fall guilty of it too. Sometimes is, Sometimes we get so consumed with the result of, hey, I want to get to college. I need a scholarship. I want to get drafted that you lose sight of the things that you need to do to give yourself the best chance to get the result that you want, which is work incredibly hard, you know, put resources into development and focus on improvement on a daily basis, monthly basis, yearly basis to get towards that. Like, don't get so consumed with the end like focus on getting better in, in the time. And that's just maybe encouraging their young player in that way. And then I think a big one, and I see this all the time, you know, in this, especially as young, younger kids is like, sometimes parents will get so consumed in like, Hey, their, their, their son is the best and they take pride in that. And, and like push the player so hard that like the, then the player doesn't separate the person from the player and, and that can be psychologically like really difficult for a young kid to deal with. Like, you know, my dad's only going to love me if I'm on the all-star team, you know what right. I mean? Or if I get four hits, but try to do as good a job as you could separating like baseball from them as, as the person, you know, because that, that I've seen that screw some kids up mentally and it's certainly not going to help the baseball side of it, but like be there and support them, but don't tie their identity to just what they do on a baseball field. Just won a national championship. How how long do you celebrate this? <laughs> or when are you going back to work for the 24 season? You might already be back to work. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, you know, last year we got a few key. We didn't make the College World Series last year. And we got a few key pieces that just won us this national championship while the other eight teams were still playing in Omaha. So I had to try to keep pace with that while we were out there. I was on the phone a little bit yesterday when we got home. We're having our celebration tonight. Um, you know, it, it's it's a treadmill a little bit, like it never stops. So what I'm really trying to do is just compartmentalize, enjoy the celebration tonight, uh, enjoyed every second of being on the field the other night. Uh, all the things that come along with winning this national championship, like this team needs to be celebrated and just keeping my eye on the ball of like, hey, we 
we need a pitcher and, you know, a left-handed hitter and all those kinds of things of the transfer portal and try to be totally immersed and present there when I'm there. But, uh, unfortunately I would love to say, Hey, I'm taking the weekend off and just going to high five or go to Hawaii. But the nature of this beast doesn't allow that. I, December is kind of the time where we're, we're allowed to shut down the batteries a little bit and, and recharge and always look forward to that time. Well, Jay Johnson, I appreciate it, man. And I appreciate you coming on it, uh, on the program on such short notice. I know you're busy. Enjoy this. Uh, Wow, you're the you are at the at the top of the college baseball world, winning that national championship. So cool. I don't know if it's about as high as you can get uh, in the baseball ladder. Maybe with the exception of winning MLB World Series, but other than that, I mean, it was pretty awesome, pretty cool. Brought back a lot of memories for me as a kid, uh, growing up watching that, wanting to get a guy that never got to Omaha. You know, I was on the break a couple times, never got there. You got there. Enjoy this uh enjoy the off season enjoy that recruiting i know that sounds like a doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me right now but uh <laughs> i really appreciate you coming on and taking the time and for those of you listening to the boom podcast thanks for listening and we'll see you next time